Thank you and welcome again to the webinar. Um, I will do a short introduction uh, of LexisNexis and why LexisNexis feels that this is very important to do. And then I will hand over to uh, Circle Partners to do the webinar. Um, we have opened up the chat for if you have questions, otherwise everybody will stay mute until the end. Uh, and, and we will answer the questions as uh, soon as possible. If there are questions that take longer, then we'll take them away and, and get back to you uh, after the meeting and uh, give you a good answer. So um, this webinar is about investment funds. We did the seminar a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, very well attended and a big success. And uh, we thought it would be very helpful to have a follow-up webinar where we can, or where Circle Partners can take you into 2020 and uh, give uh, an overview of the legislation and the changes that are coming up. Um, yeah, I should probably know LexisNexis is a, a, a big company that is uh, originated uh, from Elsevier and we can actually do a lot of things in media intelligence, patterns, and risk and compliance. So KYC checks, CDD, we can do it all. Um, and that's why we think it's important for us to host uh, webinars like this um, so that uh, people get informed of the current situation of the regulator, of new changes, AML4, AML5, stuff like that. So you really can. Uh, be prepared for what's coming uh, ahead of you. Um, and I think there's going to be a poll later on if you want to have more information on, on how we can help. Uh, by all means, say yes, and uh, we'll help you and discuss that with you. Um, uh, this is the, the guys on the line, uh, me on the left, Paul. Andrea and Nina will take over in a couple of seconds and, and guide you through it and, and walk you to 2020. Well, thank you, Paul, uh, and hello, everyone. My name is Andrea Amresan, and I am the Managing Director of uh, Circle Partners in the Netherlands. Um, first of all, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone uh, attending this uh, webinar, Investment Funds Looking Ahead of 2020. We have many countries represented here today, especially from the EU. That's nice. Good to see that uh, everybody is interested in uh, in this topic. As an administrator, we have a global presence, and we see firsthand how necessary it is to be updated to upcoming legislation, understand what's coming, and uh, be prepared. In our seminar um, last month, we talked about a few items, a few pieces of legislation, such as the AML, uh, GDPR, there were also speakers um, talking about the AFMD. And today we would like to focus um, more on um, AML, of course, because it's always a hot topic. But we will also touch upon a few matters such as uh, e-privacy and um, DAC6 and the FATCA and CRS, because we think that although some of those topics are not very, very relevant to the investment funds directly, or that the investment funds should take them into consideration and adjust their processes for 2020, um, they are still important. It's still important to understand what's going on. We've seen a lot of requests and questions from our clients and other service providers, especially with in relation to DAC6. So we think it's important to touch upon it and give you some insights. Um, with that saying, I would like to, uh, turn, to turn it over to Nina. Nina will talk about uh, AML legislation, the uh, fifth AML directive, and uh, EU privacy regulation. Uh, Nina? Uh, thank you, Andrea. Uh, the new European Union Directive Against Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing was adopted in May 2018, and it comes to supplement the currently applicable fourth AML directive. The member states have time until January 2020 to transpose the directive into their national legislation, meaning that the changes which I will summarize in the next few minutes will be applicable only as of that date, the earliest, depending on the national deadlines to be set. 
The aim of the AML directive is to take measures to prevent that the EU's financial systems is a, to prevent that the EU's financial system is abused for the purpose of money laundering and or terrorism. The scope of the directive is very broad as it is already in the fourth AML directive. Credit financial institutions, liberal professions such as auditors, accountants, advisors, company service providers, to, to name a few. And we see that with the implementation of the fifth AML directive, this scope will be broadened even further to include service providers engaged for exchanges between virtual currencies and fiat currencies and the custodian wallet providers. The points which I will touch upon have been selected from the directive to make sure that today we give a focused discussion surrounding the impact of this new legislative piece on investment funds only. So when it comes to investment funds, the fifth AML directive brings limited but relevant changes. Firstly, the scope of the directive is extended to virtual currencies platforms and electronic wallet providers. In practice, this means that virtual currencies platforms and wallet providers will become regulated entities, which will have to perform due diligence on their clients and make sure that if or when they encounter a suspicious activity or transaction, they will submit a report to the relevant authority. All virtual currencies are now covered by the directive. They are defined as a digital representation of value that can be digitally transferred, stored, or traded, and is accepted as a medium of exchange. A broad definition, which does not leave room for exceptions. Naturally, this change will mostly affect funds whose investment strategy revolves around virtual currencies. Nonetheless, the hope is that the broadening of the scope will also create a stronger comfort around virtual currencies. In other words, this is a change that creates extra work for the electronic wallet providers and virtual currencies platforms, but one which will also hopefully create a stronger feeling of trust in virtual currencies in general. Moving on to the second item, public access to the ultimate beneficial owner registers. Legal entities in the EU will have to submit dedicated to dedicated registers information referring to the ultimate beneficial owners. They will need to share information on their UBOs, such as date, place, and country of birth, residential address, tax identification number, copy of their IDs, proof that they are the UBO, and the extent of their beneficial interest. The UBO, of course, is the natural person owning 25% or more of the company. The information submitted will, be, will become publicly available to a large extent, with the sensitive tax information and copies of the documents being accessible only to certain institutions. Now, as uh, mentioned earlier, the fifth AML directive must be transposed until January 2020. But in this case, the obligation of the legal entities to submit their information to the register is dependent on a deadline imposed always by national law of each member state but no later than June 30th, 2021. Furthermore, entities must obtain and keep at the registered office the information on the UBOs as well as the relevant supporting documents. This information must be adequate, accurate, and up-to-date. And in case of dissolution, the, the dissolution of the registered entity, a location must be des designated where the information on the UBOs and the supporting documents will be kept for five years. The administrative burden and responsibility of the registration lies with those who own the entity or the managing directors, and if these are not present, with those who are in charge of the day-to-day -day business of the companies and entities. Each entity must obtain the information on its UBO and register it with the UBO register. The relevant UBO must provide the required information to the entity of which they are the ultimate beneficiary owner of, and they share the responsibility of the registration of the information. Now, this will impact investment funds set up as legal entities, as they will have to make sure that the information related to their UBO is submitted completely, correctly, and on time. If you have an existing, existing fund in one of the member states of the European Union, make sure to familiarize yourself with the national legislation regarding the UBO register. You will have to submit the required information, and you risk fines if you fail to comply. If you are thinking about setting up a fund in the near future, after the implementation of the fifth AML directive, the registration with the UBO register will take place during the Chamber of Commerce registration process. Note here that banks, civil law notaries, lawyers, and trust offices have an obligation to notify the UBO register manager 
if and when the documents they receive from their client contain information which is not accurately reflected in the Uber Ebo, Ubo register. Related to the register is also the next point. The 5th AML Directive makes it an obligation to consult with the Ubo register when performing AML due diligence. This means that KYC processes will have to be adjusted to include this. So when talking about onboarding investors, which are legal entities, the funds will now have an obligation to consult the entries of those entities in the register and document that they have done so. Of course, in the cases of fund, funds which outsource the onboarding of their investors, this should be arranged for by the party to which these services are, are outsourced. And speaking of KYC requirements, the fifth AML directive creates an obligation to perform strict enhanced due diligence in cases of financial flows coming in from high-risk third countries. For investment funds, this means that investors wiring money from a high-risk third country will have to provide evidence on the source of funds and source of wealth and information on beneficial ownership if applicable. In such cases, investment funds must also require that the, that the first subscription be sent from an account held in the name of the investor at the credit institution established in a country uh, with EU or equivalent AML standards. And moving on to one more point, through the fifth AML directive, each member state will have to create national lists of PEPs. PEPs are politically exposed persons, which means that they are a category of individuals which carry with them, by virtue of their position, a higher risk of money laundering and, among others, bribery, corruption, abuse of power. Because of this, when onboarding, onboarding investors which are PEPs, it is important to treat them as higher risk and obtain board approval. The national PEP list will make the identification of PEPs easier and hopefully more reliable. So to recap, the 5th AML Directive will bring with it regulated virtual currencies, their, their platforms, and the electronic wallet providers, the Ubo register with disclosure and client due diligence obligations, stricter enhanced due diligence rules for clients from high-risk third countries, and the national PEP list. As mentioned in the beginning, these are changes of limited impact, at least when comparing them to the previous AML directives, but they are nonetheless important and necessary when keeping in mind the aim of the directive. Moving on to the e-privacy regulation, just as entities across Europe started settling in as regards to their obligations under the general data protection regulation, it seems that a new regulation will soon come into place, which will be a more specific piece compared to the GDPR, and will focus on subjects that apply, partic that apply particularly to specific subjects. This regulation, while it was proposed in 2017, is making slow progress in the adoption process. It is expected, however, that 2020 might be the year in which it would be adopted. Indeed, as this is still a proposal, and while it might be that it will be adopted in 2020, the implementation date deadline will be later. This means that the impact it will have is not to take place quite yet. And because of this, I will not spend too much time on this, but only go through its main points. The regulation will apply the provision of electronic communication services and the use of such services. It aims to protect communications regardless of how they are made. This means that the data will remain confidential and that any interference with the communication of that data without consent of the user is prohibited. Think here of listening to calls, scanning of electronic messages, monitoring visited websites, monitoring interactions between users. These will all consi constitute a breach of the regulation. The e-privacy regulation will also apply to the use of services and tools such as Skype, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and other similar ones. And indeed, this effect affects investment funds as much as any other kind of business. Now I would like to hand it over to Andrea, who will talk to you more about the DAC6 and FATCA CRS reporting. Andrea? Well, thank you, Nina. But before we move on, maybe we can check if there are any questions or um, just to, um, if you feel like you have any questions or you would like to know a little bit more about any of the subjects, just please uh, feel free to, um, to ask the questions. Um, if not, you can drop us an email afterwards at any time. I see no questions coming in, so we'll move on with uh, DAC6. 
<laughs> the DAC6, um, Europe has made uh, significant steps over the last years in enhancing the transparency of the tax framework with the introduction of the common reporting standards and the mandatory automatic exchange of certain tax related information between tax authorities. The objectives of the Council Directive 2011-16-EU, or the Directive for Administrative Cooperation in Direct Taxation in the EU, commonly referred to as the DAC6, are to further, to further reinforce transparency of the existing tax taxation framework. Tax planning structures have evolved to be particularly sophisticated and often are developed across the various jurisdictions and move taxable profits towards more beneficial tax regimes. We all can remember the Panama Papers, which is an example of how certain financial intermediaries and other providers of tax advice um, seem to have active, actively assisted their clients in concealing money, mostly offshore. Also, aggressive tax planning has huge impact on the national tax base of each member state. Transparency is high on the global agenda of governments looking to counter tax avoidance and to create an environment of fair taxation in the internal market. DAC 6 uh, introduces uh, three key elements, um, and those will be intermediaries, main benefit, and hallmarks. The term intermediaries is quite broadly defined and includes actually any person who designs, markets, organizes, or otherwise makes available for implementation a reportable cross-border arrangement, as well as any person that regarding all facts and circumstances knows or could reasonably be expected to know that they have provided directly or by means of other persons aid, assistance or advice with respect to such arrangement. Again, a very broadly uh, definition and you would uh, have to read it a few times to really, really understand it. But it actually says that everyone who knows or helps someone to um, uh, design or implement a cross-border arrangement with the aim to um, benefit from tax exceptions uh, should be included on the intermediary definition. Um, however, member sta states are allowed to further define the concept of intermediaries, and some member states allow, for example, lawyers um, a limited waiver from the reporting obligation when they would be in breach of their duty of professional confidentiality. However, lawyers will be in that case still bound to inform other intermediaries and the taxpayer itself of their reporting obligation. If no intermediary is located in the EU, in one of the member states, the reporting obligation is shifted to the taxpayer. So if you are a taxpayer making use of a of such an arrangement, you should know you also have a uh, you will have a uh, reporting obligation, and you have to report it each year to the tax authorities in your country of residence. An intermediary is relieved of the reporting obligation if they can evidence the reporting obligation has been fulfilled by someone else. But you do need to have evidence, so make sure you ask confirmation or somehow capture the evidence that someone else did. Uh, reporting. The, the Directive uh, uh, DAC 6 uh, encompasses all taxes of any kind, with exception of VAT, custom duties, exercise duties, and compulsory social contributions. Also, one of the other, of the second element introduced by uh, DAC 6 is uh, the concept of hallmarks. Mm -hmm. DAXIS imposes mandatory reporting of cross-border arrangements affecting at least one EU member state. But when you when it falls within one of those hallmarks defined in Annex 4 of the regulation, those are hallmarks are broad categories setting out particular characteristics identified as potentially indicative of aggressive tax planning. 
An arrangement will be reportable if it meets, meets at least one of the hallmarks. For hallmarks categories A, B, and certain elements of the category C, an arrangement will only be reportable if it's also captured by the so-called uh, main benefit test. That's, again, that's the third element introduced by DAC6. By DAC6. So the main benefit test will be satisfied if it can be established that the main benefit or one of the main benefits which having regard to all relevant facts and circumstances, a person may reasonably expect to derive from an arrangement is the obtaining of a tax advantage. So if you can reasonably um, assess that an arrangement is uh, set up or implemented with the main benefit to uh, obtain a tax advantage, then the main benefit test has been satisfied. The hallmarks defined uh, in the Annex 4 of the DAC 6 serve as the key element, defining whether a cross-border arrangement qualifies as a reportable cross-border arrangement. I will briefly, briefly explain a little bit um, each of the hallmarks. We don't go into much details because I don't think uh, we'll have enough time to discuss all aspects. It's quite technical as well, so um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, hallmark A um, are more generic, uh, generic arrangements. For example, arrangements that include confidentiality uh, conditions that would require the taxpayer or other involved parties to not disclose to other intermediaries or tax authorities how the arrangement could secure a tax advantage. Category B includes certain tax planning features, such as buying a loss-making company to exploit its losses in order to reduce tax liability. Another example in category B would be would involve arrangements aimed at converting income into capital in order to obtain a tax benefit, or arrangements which include uh, circular transactions resulting in the round tripping of funds. Again, for category A and B, the main benefit test must apply. For category C, we have uh, refers to specific hallmarks for cross-border transactions. Um, cross-border payments especially, and some of those hallmarks are also subject to the main benefit test. For example, deduction for the same depreciation on an asset claimed in more than one jurisdiction. In category D, we have specific hallmarks for um, concerning mostly the automatic exchange of information and beneficial ownership. So those would be arrangements that are created with the aim to hide the ultimo beneficial owner or arrangement that we uh, created in order to avoid uh, reporting under the common reporting standard or other exchange uh, of information obligations between the tax authorities. For example, the transfer of a financial uh, account to another financial account or asset not subject to reporting under the common reporting standard or an arrangement involving a non-transparent legal um, ultima beneficial owner uh, using of uh, certain of multiple layers of uh, entities in different uh, jurisdictions would be one of uh, an example that would fit in uh, in category d and then we have category e which are specific hallmarks concerning transfer pricing, the transfer of hard-to-value uh, hard intangible assets when no reliable comparable exists and the projection of future cash flow or income are highly uncertain. So those will be the main categories or the categories, uh, uh, the different hallmark categories defined. They are further specified in, uh, in uh, Appendix 4 of DAC 6 and each jurisdiction, each member state, when they issue guidance or comments on the legislation, they will provide more uh, more detail and more explanation on the, on the hallmarks. And hopefully by the time that it will all be implemented, uh, we will have a little bit more clarity and more details on which transaction exactly uh, should be reported. 
I think it will be uh, still case by case and uh, it will much depend on the knowledge and the willingness of uh, certain uh, intermediaries to report the transaction. So the timeline, um, although not yet uh, implemented at national level, the disclosure obligations need to be treated as live as, uh, as they provide for qualifying transactions um, put in place on June 25th of 2018 or after 25th of June 2018, to be reported already in, uh, next year. So you need to keep in mind that from the transaction started already in 2018, should be reporting uh, already next year. Reportable cross-border arrangements, um, uh, whose first implementation steps occurs, occurred this, in, uh, uh, this year, will be reported in July, uh, uh, around July the 1st, 2020, but not late, later than August 31st. And after that, for each uh, transaction, you will have a 30-day uh, turnaround period to report to the tax authorities. On October 31st of 2020, the first exchange of information will take place between the different uh, tax authorities of the state members. And the aim is to exchange the information every quarter. So I'm curious what that will bring. <laughs> so how do investment funds qualify? Do they qualify as intermediary and should they report? Well, it is important to notice that the definition of, the definition of intermediary also includes any person that knows or could be reasonably expected to know that they have undertaken to provide directly or by means of another person, aid, assistance, or advice, advice in relation to a reportable cross-border arrangement. Well, <laughs> again, a quite broad definition, but for now, we can only um, uh, look a little bit on, on what the European Fund and Asset Management Association, Association wrote on December 2018. Um, they wrote a paper addressed to all tax administration of the member states in which further clarification is requested for some of the terms, definitions, and hallmarks that could be interpreted as applying to investment funds. For investment funds, usually tax benefit will not be the main benefit and would most probably not even qualify as a main benefit at all. At the end, investors invest in an investment fund for a long-term investment, uh, gain some profit, but not specifically for a tax benefit. Loss. But even where the tax is the main benefit to one party, the investor, that will not normally be apparent to the other parties, the fund manager. It's most likely that uh, a legal advisor will know more about that. So for now, it seems that based on the available information and further explanation issued by different member states, the intermediaries will only include lawyers, accountants, trust management advisories, um, tax advisors, or for tax consultants, and bankers. However, it is important to monitor the updates issued by the member states as the interpretation of certain key elements can still be adjusted or further clarified. So that's about uh, taxes. I hope we can we gave you a little bit of insight on, on the requirements, uh, deadlines, and uh, for now, um, when it, when we look at the investment funds, um, I think we are safe <laughs> from a perspective of investment. We don't have to report on top of all the other reporting obligations that uh, they have, but uh, we should keep it. Uh, we should keep an eye on the developments uh, in relation to taxes and uh, be aware of the regulation of the uh, obligations of uh, certain ser cert uh, service providers within the chain um, if they have any questions then you know why so we'll move on to fatca and crs and although fatca and crs are methods that by now should be well embedded in our day-to-day -day activities and everybody should know everything about it, <laughs> um, we still see a lot of questions and we still see a lot of um, financial institutions struggling to 
remain compli compliant, uh, struggling to um, uh, do the reporting on time and understand for each jurisdiction what the requirements are. Again, for today, we won't go into too much detail, but we'll just try to do a, a short recap of what FATCA is and CRS and what the deadlines are. So the FATCA and CRS, uh, the aim of the US Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, commonly referred to as FATCA, is to identify US taxpayers who are hiding their wealth offshore uh, in a bid to evade paying taxes. FATCA requires financial institutions and those will be almost all the investment managers or, in, or investment management funds to report details to all of accounts um, about all accounts held or controlled by US taxpayers. Depending on the type of the so-called uh, IGA or intergovernmental agreement between each member state and, uh, of the EU and the US, the data must be reported to the tax authorities in the member state or directly to the IRS. So, for example, Austria has, uh, will have to report to, directly to IRS because they have an IGA Type 2 uh, agreement with the US, whereas in the Netherlands, financial institutions should report directly to the Dutch tax authorities <coughs> because the Netherlands has an IGA Type 1 agreement with the US. So what do um, financial institutions have to do? Appoint a FATCA reporting officer, that's important, or outsource it to a service provider who will provide a FATCA reporting officer. Registration with IRS and confirmation of the category of financial institution applicable to the fund, and obtaining the global intermediary identification number, the so-called GENE. I think by now everybody knows that you cannot if you want to open a bank account without having a gene. So those are, those are the first steps uh, financial institutions should take, especially investment funds. And of course, they will need to identify and classify their U.S. investors, keep records of those uh, activities, um, monitor for U.S. indicia, uh, say, for example, a telephone number. If an investor suddenly has a U.S. telephone number, you should inquire, okay, uh, does your tax status uh, changes or uh, you need to make sure you are on top of that and of course you will have to report on an annual basis. And then we have the common reporting standard which is a global standard for automatic exchange of financial account information and it was developed by the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And CRS is designed to prevent tax evasion, of course, as FATCA, but it gives um, uh, participating countries transparency on the financial assets held by their residents in other jurisdictions. As FATCA, CRS requires financial institutions to identify customer tax residences and report financial accounts held directly or indirectly by foreign tax residents to local tax authorities. So, for example, a fund registered in the Luxembourg will have to identify all tax residences of their investors and they will have to establish if there are tax residents in other jurisdictions than Luxembourg. And those tax residents will have to be reported to the Luxembourg tax authorities. Afterwards, the tax authorities will exchange the information between themselves. More than 100 countries have committed to CRS, including all EU member states, but also offshore jurisdiction and major centers around the world, the Singapore, and Hong Kong, and um, the Cayman Islands, and the BVIs, they are all committed to CRS and they are starting exchanging the data. Of course, the US is not committed to the CRS because it had already committed to the automatic exchange of information under the pre-existing FATCA. And CRS applies to all individuals and legal entities. For both regulation applies that in more, than, more and more jurisdictions, even if the financial institution has identified no reportable accounts, a so-called NIL report must be submitted. Each jurisdiction has its own reporting deadline. As you can see, for example, I just named a few, uh, just to give you an, an, 
an example for the Luxembourg, the deadline would be uh, June 30 of each year. For Malta, it's April 30, and for the Netherlands, will be August the 1st. So you have to uh, check very well for your particular jurisdiction what the reporting deadlines are. And those deadlines are usually they are set for the uh, so we know upfront when they will be, but sometimes they are you know postponed or maybe there are changes, so you need to follow up on uh, the updates. For now, the deadlines for 2020 would be the same as almost the same as uh, as it was to in 2019. So Luxembourg, June 30, Malta, April 30, and the Netherlands, August 1st. It is also important to pay attention to other domestic tax related uh, reporting requirements. Um, I thought it's good to name, especially for the Dutch um, funds, investment funds, um, the so-called rentsineering. Um, it's a Dutch term, so some of you might not understand it, but it has to do with um, a domestic regime which requires financial institutions in the Netherlands to report information about um, Dutch tax resident um, investors. And that information should be submitted to the Dutch tax authorities on of before February the 1st. There are also some requirements for investment funds or providers of payment and saving products that would have to report on May 1st to the tax authorities. And those two requirements are related to, again, Dutch tax resident investors. Uh, also important to notice that the FGR structures, the Dutch FGR structures, are still exempt from this reporting, especially for the first one, February 1st. So no reporting requirement for 2020 uh, for this part. I think a couple of weeks ago there was an, uh, a publication on on the, um, on the website of the tax authorities uh, saying that uh, regulated uh, funds regardless of their uh, structure, including the uh, FGR should report on the, uh, before the February 1st, but that was uh, also again cancelled a couple of weeks ago. So we uh, we don't have to do that for the FGR funds with the FGR structure. So that's good. So that will be for uh, the FATCA and CRS. Uh, and again, you will need to make sure you um, check the deadlines, reported deadlines for your specific jurisdiction. And if there are any questions in relation to that, we'll be happy to help. Uh, so, so thank you very much for the for the webinar. Very interesting uh, subject and very good, very well laid out, very informative and clear because we haven't got any questions uh, up till now. So that's good. Um, we have a poll uh, on the system that you can fill out whether you want to have some more information on LexisNexis or Circle Partners or anything else. Maybe you have some ideas on, on uh, future uh, webinars. That's also fine to get. Um, I think it's it's also important to keep in view our LinkedIn pages and other websites where we can where we will uh, announce upcoming webinars, seminars, and all sorts of other uh, events. I believe we have another event at the 5th of November uh, with regards to integrity management. So if you haven't signed up or you haven't uh, decided to come, by all means do come because it's interesting and it's important to manage your image and your uh, uh, solutions. Um, I think that sort of rounds up what we've done today. I want to thank Circle Partners for their input and their great uh, story and marketing from LexisNexis for setting this up. And of course, you all for uh, tuning in and listening to the webinar. And I hope to hear you uh, the next time when we do another webinar. Thank you.